Okay. Right. So now if I want to stop it, it'll still, and I just hit it again, it starts. Does it, where is it? It says it's being recorded now. Okay. Good morning. Uh, we're still waiting just a minute or two to see where everybody, uh, make sure everybody that wants to come to this is going to be getting logged in. And uh, if anybody's still having problems uh, getting their sound on or their video, let us know. Uh, you, uh, I'm going to do a little intro here and then we're going to explain how we're going to be working today and then we'll get started. Um, we're doing a class today on design your landscape to your site. Um, I'm going to do the first half. Uh, I'm Valerie Massey and I'm the horticultural program assistant for the Mantee County Mobile Irrigation Lab. Some of you may have had uh, uh, our lab come out and do an evaluation of your irrigation and landscape. Uh, Susan Griffith, who's our Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, is going to do the second half of this program. And uh, you're in for a treat there. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get started and then I will reintroduce so that uh, we'll be able to add, start with the recording at that point. Okay. Before we begin, um, I know maybe a lot of us has, have had the chance to be on Zoom meetings or Zoom webinars uh, in the last year, uh, but some of us haven't. And, you know, we all still kind of have to work with this to get it all figured out. So if you're having a problem uh, and you need to adjust on your end or we need to adjust on our end, please let us know. And um, there are some controls in the Zoom uh, menu uh, if you need. Uh, mainly, you're most likely going to, I think what we're going to use is probably the chat section. Uh, you can do question and answer. But mainly, if you put in a question in the chat uh, location, Susan will be uh, monitoring that and checking with you. Uh, while I'm giving my presentation and I will do the same for her when she is giving her presentation. So if, uh, say hi to uh, the pan, say hi right now via the chat if you could in the chat section, just type in hi or who you, then we'll see that everything's working for you. Uh, we are gonna record this webinar and uh, we will, it will probably be available online um, within a couple of weeks or three weeks or something, um, and we can send you the link if you'd like. Um, the question and answers or any chat will not be in the recording, so just to let you know. So let's get started. Good morning. My name is Valerie Massey, and I, hold on, I am the... Uh, Horticulture Program Assistant for the Manatee County Mobile Irrigation Lab. And uh, we go out and do uh, irrigation and landscape evaluation for homeowners in Manatee County who have an in-ground irrigation system. For This is a uh, focus of the program is for water conservation and still having a healthy landscape. Uh, what we're going to be uh, the second person, and I'm so lucky to be giving a presentation with her, is Susan Griffith, who is our irrigation I'm sorry, is our Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And uh, she is going to do the second half of this uh, program, design your landscape to your site. And um, when we get, when I get done with my half of the program, we'll take a little break so that everybody can get up and get a cup of coffee or use the restroom or whatever they need. And then Susan will get started with the second half. So um, we'll get started now. And again, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat area and Susan will try to take care of you for the moment. Thank you for coming today. We uh, 
appreciate uh, your time that you take to learn more about uh, water conservation, about Florida friendly landscaping, and uh, let's get started. Okay. Um, in what we're going to go over today is several things. Uh, we're going to plan your landscape. We're going to uh, look at trees, shrubs, ground covers, Florida friendly principles in practice. And the whole idea behind Florida friendly landscaping is that it's an integrated approach to maintaining uh, attractive and colorful, diverse yard. But um, doing that with native plants and Florida friendly plants and being environmentally responsible is, is what we're focusing on. So most important um, principle and uh, is right plant, right place. It's the first principle. And Susan will be going into this a little bit uh, more in depth when she um, starts her presentation. But if you can remember that first principle, that really will take care of a lot of things. Right plant, right place. Uh, the the you're going to select the right plants for your site. Um, and if you use um, it'll native plants in particular will help you uh, use less water, less maintenance, uh, less fertilizer, pesticides and all that once uh, everything's established. Plants like the ones on the left uh, that are near a, a um, walkway or concrete pathway they're going to be something that can handle a drier location. Uh, plants on the right in the right photo there and that uh, screen is something that is going to be a wetter area. It's a plant that can use uh, wet feet or prefer a little bit more moisture. So again, you know, thinking about what you're doing with the selecting the right plant. Now, the question is, um, whether these are good choices and why the question is why why are we asking that so let's say um, the one up here on the left top you're going to be doing a lot of trimming you can see that you're always going to have to be consider concerned with uh, how the plants grow into your walkway uh, it could be a trip hazard if you put happen to put an agave plant near your uh, walkway you might be poking yourself and that's no fun uh, the bottom right um, photograph of the uh, plant. Again, you're going to be having to trim that, and it's going to be a pro it could be become a problem. Rocks uh, for Florida landscapes are not the best just because of the amount of the temperature uh, in our summers. Uh, we like to see a mulch that is uh, more. Uh, like a wood mulch or things that are going to help to retain moisture in the root zone and to uh, moderate the temperature in the root zone. So that is why that is, these are the not necessarily good choices. When you're going to plan your landscape, you're going to look at your site, you're going to determine what your needs are, you're going to prepare the site appropriately and, you know, think about do design use design concepts and considerations when you're laying everything out and if you do all this prep beforehand before you actually go out and buy any plants or select you know if you design and make your considerations you're going to have a lot more success in what your uh, final uh, landscape design and installation is Avoid problems later by, again, uh, picking the right plant, the right place. Uh, you make sure that the plants you are selecting are going to get their needs met and you're going to use the le least amount of water, least amount of pesticides, and, you know, the least amount of work. You'll have more time to enjoy your yard. Again, plan first. Uh, you can start with as, as small as or simple uh, drawing as what is down in the bottom right. And then you can get uh, more detailed by using graph paper. 
uh, you can go to uh, the property appraiser's office and, you know, print out a sketch of your home landscape. You can look at the aerial photos in uh, Manti counties of your landscape, of your house area. And so there's a lot of uh, choices of what you can do to help you start to plan. So you want to look at your existing site right now. You want to, um, what do you want to change, keep or what do you want to change? Uh, how much sunlight do you have? How much shade? What are your soil characteristics? Uh, do you have clay? Do you have sand? Do you have areas where it's a low area and because you have, maybe you have clay, it doesn't drain well and it sits there. And so uh, that's not, most of the time that's not gonna be good for <clears throat> most plants to have standing water. There are some plants that you know, can handle that kind of uh, uh, condition. So again, thinking about what you wanna change and um, in what order. <clears throat> okay, and what we have up here um, in the map is showing the um, zones for man uh, for the state of Florida, and we are in uh, nine uh, nine A is out in <clears throat> excuse me East Manatee, um, so there it colder temperatures there some. Uh, plants are not going to do as well as if they were in 9b which is where we are here at the extension office in Palmetto and Bradenton and most most a part of uh, Manti County is 9b out on the coast or closer to west uh, northwest Braden and west Braden and out in the beaches you're more like 10a and so it's warmer and so more tropical plants can manage out there because it doesn't get near as cold think about that kind of uh, thing about what your zone is for making uh, plant choices. Uh, you want to consider the orientation of your house, you know, where you're getting your sun and your shade, um, and choose plants that are recommended for your zone. Now, I, uh, it, this is a wonderful resource and this tells you how you can order it. Uh, it's a free book and they will send it to you free. This tells you how to either do one of two things to order an actual book that'll be shipped to you, or um, if you want to download it uh, as a PDF. So good instructions. And when I talk about different resources here as we're going through, um, just wanna make a point of recommending that you take advantage of the uh, Master Gardener's Plant Clinic here at the Extension Office in Palmetto. Uh, and uh, they are open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And you can bring in soil samples to do, have tests done for pH. You can bring in plant samples that you don't know what's wrong with it and you wanna get their you know, help with that. So a wonderful resource that's free and uh, the, the soil uh, samples or water samples, that is something that we charge a very um, small amount for, but their knowledge uh, and help at the, at the plant clinic is free. And this, going back to this, uh, the Florida Friendly Landscape Guide that I uh, showed where, that you could order, this is uh, page 31. There's the key that gives you all the information, the little symbols so that when you go through the book, you can figure out what it's telling you about a particular plant. Uh, if you look here, this is uh, one of the plants, let's say muley grass, it's gonna tell you that it's uh, good in all the zones, uh, north, central, and south zones eight through 11 and it's asking whether it's native it's telling you yes and tells you how much water uh, it preferences it tells you uh, what if it in um, uh, wildlife if it attracts wildlife uh, it's a wonderful resource it's not the only one that's uh, the only resource but it's a really great place to start and like i said it's a free resource also you can go on to floridayards.org uh, and uh, they have wonderful things you can select, uh, different categories that will uh, help you find out uh, information for plant selection. 
uh, Florida Friendly Plant database is again one of the ones that uh, they will help you with and you make a selection of whether you're in central florida uh, which we are um, uh, tells you plant types you make a selection of one of those categories and then you go to the next button and on and on and it narrows down to help you make selections and of course again uh, choices some uh, there, the Florida, the Master Gardeners uh, Plant Clinic can help you if you have some questions about particular plants, and uh, you can uh, speak with them about that. Site analysis. Okay, so what do we, what do we, what do you have, and how are you going to use it? You want to look and decide what kind of views you have. Whether you want to make sure you keep a view if you live on a pond. Uh, whether you want to change the view. So maybe you want to put up a nice screening for privacy. Um, do you have, you know, what hardscapes you're going to be dealing with? Uh, are there structural limitations or obstructions? And again, sun or shade, how much of sun or shade? Draw out your map of your house of what's existing uh, and how you want to change that. How do you, how you currently use the property? Do you have space for family activities? Do you have pets? Uh, do you want an outdoor entertainment area? Do you need storage area or do you have that already? Um, do you have a vegetable garden? Do you want to increase that or uh, change it to something else? And then design considerations. How much level of maintenance do you want? Do you have a higher maintenance level now that you want to change that to more native plants and things with that need less water and need less maybe pruning uh, or pesticide or um, that kind of thing? Um, make sure that when you're looking at plant considerations, uh, what's the mature size? to make sure that if you put in a maybe a seven gallon pot or something that's maybe three feet tall, but it's eventually going to be 15 or 20 feet tall and 15 feet wide, is it really going to fit in that space? Uh, if you put in a shrub um, for hedging and it may be, you know, two feet tall and you put it in, but it, it ultimately wants to grow to eight or nine or 10 feet tall and you don't want it that tall, you're, you're constantly going to be having to prune that. So think about the uh, mature size when you're looking at your plants. Uh, level of maintenance. Again, do you want a more uh, pruned and uh, uh, maintenance, maybe intense uh, landscape? Do you want something that has more uh, native plants that, again, might be more uh, simpler, a little more freeform, might not need as much pruning? Uh, again, that's going to work if you are selecting the right plant for the right place. I, I was saying earlier that you need to make sure if you select what your uh, eventual size is going to be. Um, mature height, the spread, the growth rate, what's the shape going to be. Uh, some, if you want uh, to use the natural shape of a plant's growth and you don't have to do much pruning, you need to think about that. If you want something that's uh, meant to be pruned to have a more uh, formal landscape, that's fine, you know, but you think about what type of plant you select that will be, will work well for that. Uh, you can see a little bit more of uh, a natural growth here on the left. Uh, obviously, this was not the right place to plant this tree, this uh, palm tree in the upper left, uh, I'm sorry, the, the top photo. And um, another thing to consider is salt tolerance. If you live uh, out on the beach area, you may have high salt um, pH uh, in your soil. If you use reclaimed water, that, that might be an issue with reclaim, uh, higher salt. Uh, and so you want to make sure you're using a salt tolerant plant and uh, to help your landscape be a happier one. Again, shade, sun, pH of your soil, 
and uh, whether it's a plant that's more susceptible to pest. And like I said before, native or non-native. We talked a little bit about, we wanna make sure what the orientation is of your house, because we wanna make sure that the uh, plant that you're using uh, will get the right amount of sun or shade. Some plants can, like bougainvillea, can, would prefer to have eight to 10 hours of sun. Uh, plants more like um, mondo grass or things um, would prefer to have more shade and some plants uh, would prefer to have full shade. So right plant, right place. So if you think about, if you go on the um, property appraisers, you can look at a aerial map of your home and uh, you can see what the orientation is if you're not sure by just walking outside. Uh, we want to check your soil. Um, some of you already know by trying to plant something whether you have compact soil. Uh, the, you can determine what kind of soils you have by doing a perk test. That means you are going to dig a hole about 19 inches down and you can fill it with water. And if you, um, if it drains right away, you have very sandy soil, low water holding capacity. If it takes several hours uh, to drain, moderate drainage, and that's probably okay for most plants. If water is standing the next morning, you have a problem. And that means that you most likely have compact soils. Uh, sometimes, um, the plant, the uh, ponds that are dug out and the soil is taken to build your pad for your home makes a great pad for building your home. It's very solid. But um, if your landscape has been put in and maybe there wasn't amending uh, amendments done to the soil to help uh, break it up, you most likely have clay and compaction possibly from the equipment running over the, the um, area, the landscape area when the uh, building is being done. So it has to be something that uh, you can always do things with that to help the compaction. And we're gonna talk about that. You wanna think about what your irrigation source is. Uh, is it county water, um, which is, most likely the pH is gonna be fine. Well water can have uh, issues with uh, salt water intrusion. Reclaimed water definitely uh, has higher salts because of um, nutrient runoff or uh, how it's processed. And then of course, rainwater. Um, sometimes people have wells that have a problem with saltwater intrusion. Definitely out on the, uh, out near the beach, there have been communities that have had to even stop using their wells because they were so bad with the saltwater intrusion, even salt tolerant plants were having a problem with it. But you can see the uh, edges um, on the leaves that show that's a problem with this particular issue for these particular plants. So you got to think about whether if that's an issue with you having a well that may have that problem, we have to pick, select plants that are more salt tolerant. Uh, you can have a buildup of salts with reclaimed water when you have compact soils, unless you can flush um, the if you can have a fresh water source to flush your plants, the irrigation water through or the buildup can't, uh, will flush through, but then you're trying to use a lot of fresh water that you're gonna pay for. <laughs> um, so thinking about using the right amount of water, this uh, particular example here on the left, you see some micro irrigation uh, tubes down at the bottom. And that particular landscape bed was irrigating, I think three days a week with the micro irrigation. And this was reclaimed water. And then there was also 
two or three different zones that happen to have rotors that were hit going across that landscape bed also three times a week. And uh, rotors tend to get a higher amount of time for the coverage for the turf grass. So this particular location was just getting inundated with the amount of reclaimed water and it's a very compact soil. And that was an issue. So you can, um, you know, you can help with changing your soil via aeration, plug aeration. You can, of course, what we recommended in this particular homeowner's uh, situation is we had them turn down their time and their frequency. You're only, only supposed to water twice a week at the most. We want to uh, think uh, we, uh, it's a good idea when if you don't know your soil pH or if you've have have not had any uh, thoughts that maybe there's a problem with your soil pH because of certain plants that you have, then uh, you can have bring in a soil sample to the master gardeners and they will do a soil sample for pH. Uh, it is something that's done once a week, I believe. And it's not, like I said, it's four or five dollars. It's not a big uh, investment, but it definitely will help you make better choice of what plants would be appropriate for your pH, soil pH. When you look at um, this plant, a lot of people have exoras in their yard. It's a nice orange flower, could be a peach color. Um, if they, they prefer a more acid soil and more around probably five or 5.5, your pH, uh, range is 0 to 14. 7 is neutral and most plants like slightly neutral maybe about 6.2 to 6.5. <clears throat> like I said the exoras prefer something around 5 uh, so they much prefer a more acid soil. So you can see that what's happening is their roots are down in that soil and it just does not allow certain nutrients to be taken up because that um, that nutrient is not available through the soil because of the pH. The, uh, there's an iron deficiency here on the left and the phosphorus or potassium deficiency on the right with the spots. And you can, um, and going back to this, you can, uh, if you just have your heart set on having exoras, you can always use an acid a liquid fertilizer for acid loving plants and mix it according to the label and you can spray the foliage with that solution. And it can take it and take the nutrients up through the foliage. But the idea behind the nine principles or the very first principle of Florida friendly landscaping is right plant, right place. And if you have a very high alkaline soil, exoras may not be the right one for your location. You want to look, you want to do the site preparation. Um, you want to take out um, unwanted plants and debris. If you have, if you're going to really change an area, if you're going to put in more landscape plants or uh, ground covers instead of turf grass, here's an opportunity to make sure you prepare everything correctly. Uh, take out any dead grass or dead plants. Make sure that you're preparing the soil correctly, fixing the grade, amending the soil. Um, how can I improve compact soils? Uh, if when we come out to do our evaluation on people's landscape, we do take a soil core and that we try to get down about eight inches. A lot of times compact soils from on, especially in newer homes, uh, two, three, four inches. And it's maybe quite a bit of clay. And so the water really can't perk down and drain properly. properly. So what you can do on the turf grass areas is you can use a plug aeration. Uh, and you can do that once a year for several years and you can then top dress the area after you do, do the plug aeration, which pops out a little um, plug of this, the compact soil. It pops it out onto the top of the turf grass and 
then you just let it lay there and it can fall apart and go back into the soil. But then you can top dress with uh, just a half inch of good soil uh, and make sure and rake it all in. And after you do that for several years, it's going to help you have better, looser soil, better percolation, your turf grass uh, roots will be healthier. They'll be able to reach down deeper. The, um, in the landscape beds, you can continue to mulch and add compost and that will help to break up um, also the soil area to be better per, for drainage. You want to make sure, think about site preparation. Um, consider all the things that may be an issue. Compacted soils, what we've been talking about, which are really the, the roots don't have anywhere to go if the soil is compact. They may just, you know, go down, down a couple of inches and then go sideways if they can. Um, mechanical injuries, uh, when you have people that may be doing, um, if there's any construction that's being done on your landscape area, uh, pedestrian and vehicle traffic, especially when they're uh, building your pad and then building your house, they're running heavy equipment over your landscape areas, uh, the turf grass areas that I mentioned earlier that um, it's compacting the soil fur further. And if they don't do any, any amendment, then that's why before they put the landscape on, that's why it, um, creates a problem for drainage. <clears throat> you want to be sure and buy healthy plants. Look for new growth. Uh, the roots should be white and fibrous. Uh, you don't want really pot bound plants. Uh, and you want to make sure that you don't have this kind of uh, circling of the roots down at the bottom at the base. It just, uh, the plant is, and the tree is not going to uh, thrive like you want it to. <clears throat> you want to make sure that if you have the opportunity and you've uh, uh, identified any invasives or even possibly cautionary plants that could become invasive, uh, that are too vigorous for growers, they're not, you know, get them, get them out of your yard take them out if they're if you're not uh, hearts not set on it we want to do that because what an invasive plant does is it's it's such a vigorous grower that that pushes out other native habitats um, other native plants that are habitats or food sources for our birds and wildlife and so we want to help them have a healthy uh, environment and so we want to make sure we take out invasive plants out of our landscape some common invasive plants that you will see is uh, Mexican petunia. You will see the uh, multicolored lantana. Uh, carrot wood, you don't see, um, this can become a huge tree. So if you see it in a small form in your landscape come sprouting up somewhere, take it out while you have the opportunity to do it easily. Orchid trees, um, again, these are things that, uh, just a few, there's many, many invasive plants. Trees in the landscape uh, provide a framework for the rest of the landscape. And so when you're designing, if you're, if you're especially if you're starting with um, a landscape where there's not a lot of plants or trees in there, really think about the spacing and where you wanna put them, where you're gonna shade, <clears throat> if you're putting in plants that are deciduous, um, you want to make sure where they where you put them. So when they lose their leaves, uh, that might be an opportune time for them to give you sun into a particular uh, room in the winter time. Uh, they increase property values for trees. Uh, they attract wildlife, and they help reduce energy costs, which is all something that we like to uh, save money. Uh, think about site and design considerations, selecting the right place for a tree. As you can see, a lot of trees uh, we see every day when you drive down a, a road, they've had to trim a tree a certain way 
that we wouldn't normally do, but there's power lines that are going through there. And, and instead of taking the tree down, they prune it this way. So if you're putting in a new tree, look up, look down, look around, especially look up. What is that mature size going to be? Uh, is do you have you know do you have adequate space for that tree in the width? Um, and you want to make sure that you want to you want to plant trees at least 15 feet from the foundation of a home. Uh, more factors to consider: if you are changing the grade uh, in your yard and you already have existing trees, and if you put in you can really damage or kill trees if you change your grade or heap up a lot of soil uh, around their base. Because their roots are, uh, if you have an oak tree, for instance, and let's say it has a 40 foot wide canopy, their roots are out that far to the edge or further. And so you want to make sure that you're not putting a lot of soil on those roots or you can suffocate them. The um, trees can be damaged by construction and they may not show uh, something that's immediately going to hurt them, but over time uh, it becomes a problem. And depending on how it's pruned, if you top a tree or prune a tree incorrectly, it, it uh, can be a problem It'd be uh, to the health of the tree and then become a dangerous situation otherwise. Susceptible uh, trees that have been damaged are much more susceptible to uh, insects and disease. So again, there's a lot of reason uh, to consider uh, how you uh, change the grade, how you uh, prune, how you, you know, and what that's going to, how that stresses trees. On your tree installation, you want to make sure that uh, Again, enough space. <clears throat> you don't want to plant it too deep. Uh, you don't want to underwater it. You want to make sure you give it enough time to uh, water it correctly uh, and get it established. A certain plant, let's say you start with a small plant, uh, one gallon, three gallon, seven gallon, whatever. Those t take a much, they establish much quicker than a tree. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see it around the base of a tree, you'll see a little bubbler and that's fine and dandy. But after a certain amount of time, you can turn off that little bubbler. Uh, you can see here in this photo, you see staking of trees. Uh, that's to help keep it uh, in high winds once they're, when it's first planted. You want to make sure that that plant has a little bit of the, the, the uh, plant guying ropes or whatever. You want to give it a little bit of sway capability. They're much healthier um, and they're going to do better if they get a little bit of movement capability. But that way, if you do have high winds after it's first um, planted, then that's something that can be uh, can help the plant stay upright and, and healthy. And after a uh, plant, uh, a tree for sure in six months to actually probably more closer to a year, those strapping around the tree need to be removed uh, because otherwise that tree trunk will eventually grow over those straps and you won't be able to, they'll be grown into the trunk. You don't want to over mulch. Um, sometimes you will, you want a two to three inch depth and you want the mulch pulled back from a uh, top of the root ball. Um, when you put in a tree, you want to make sure that the tree uh, root ball is a, bit, a little bit higher so that you don't uh, have water running into the root ball and up against the trunk. You can see that uh, we want to dig a shallow hole and wide hole and find the, uh, make sure that the topmost root and tree root uh, doesn't have any problems. Depending on the size of the plant or the tree we're talking about here, you want the tree root, uh, top root, you want it to be one to two inches above the landscape soil. And that's so that as it settles and you've got it all jetted in with get rid of bubbles or air pockets, 
it's going to set a little bit. It's you still want it to be above the um, soil, the remaining outer soil level, so that the water runs off. You want to straighten the tree. You want to remove any synthetic materials. Um, you want to make sure and add and firm backfill soil. And you can add your mulch out and around, um, create a, a trough around it so that uh, you can contain that water in the root uh, ball area when you're watering. So if you look at the, uh, I was talking about you want to be at least one to two inch above the surrounding soil. You can see here that is the case. And here it's below that surrounding area so that as you plant that, you possibly, the soil might be higher than it should be on the plant and the water can run towards the trunk and it can then create a problem with uh, possible root rot or issues for the uh, tree. <clears throat> Most plant, most trees, most plants can be uh, planted any time of the year in this location. And um, granted, maybe not in January, February, if we're really having some cold times, but we want to make sure that you avoid fertilizing a tree uh, until it is established and uh, utilizing the proper irrigation. Again, um, there are certain lengths of time that you need to continue watering. Uh, it's usually every day for the first uh, month or every couple of weeks and then every other day for the months after that. But it depends on the size of the plant or the tree you're starting with. Uh, woody uh, definition for a shrub is their woody plant. They're usually with multiple trunks and branches. Provide, uh, they provide structure, texture, and color to a landscape. Many can be pruned to become hedges or topiary figures. Again, do you want a more relaxed uh, landscape? Do you want a more formal uh, hedge type or pruned? Landscape, those are the kinds of things that you'll have to, uh, that you want to think about when you're uh, making your selection of choices and laying out your plant uh, design of your layout of your landscape. Uh, shrubs in the landscape, you want to plant in large groups, group according to water and maintenance needs, uh, space according to mature size. Again, think about you. You may start with a smaller tree, but how big is it going to be? How big is that um, plant shrub could be? Uh, viburnum can be get up to 12, 15 feet tall. But if you're putting it right next to your house and you want it to stay under a window, you're going to be constantly pruning that plant. So think about where you're going to put it and why, you know, what size you want it to be. When you're installing shrubs, uh, there's a certain distance from structures for, uh, you wanna think about your roof drip line. You wanna make sure that you get your plant out far enough away that you don't have all this runoff just right on top of that plant. A uh, good thing that we suggest on mulch is that around the perimeter of your house, if you have a foot and a half to two feet of rock area, that will help with drainage next to your structure. It also eliminates the, helps to eliminate the uh, bridge for termites. So it's better if you don't have uh, uh, mulch right up to your uh, regular wood mulch right up to your structure. Uh, rocks are much better for that. And you can see what it's suggesting is you want a certain distance out to the center of your first plant and the root ball and then you're going to add a foot. So installing distance from shrubs. So the five foot maturity at width at maturity for a plant. If you, you know, move it out another foot so that you have enough space next to your house so you don't, you're not 
it, it also allows you to be able to get back there and prune it or check it out. And you're not, you know, just all squished up trying to get next to your house. Now, if you have, if that, you have small space beside your house or between your home and your neighbors, you know, you think about that in terms of how you're planting, what size plants you're, that's another consideration for what kind of plant will fit in that area. You want to uh, dig your hole a correct, uh, appropriately, uh, one and a half times wider than the root ball, uh, one inch shallower. You want to shave off the entire, excuse me, the entire outer periphery of the root ball. You place the plant in the hole and you fill around the sides. And uh, it's a good way to is get rid of any uh, air pockets in there is you can use a little jet of water and then pack it down, make sure that it's tight. You don't want to put mulch around the plant. Don't put it on top of the root ball, just around the perimeter. Okay, now we're going to, um, again, we started at the beginning, I was talking about uh, design your yard, and there's a lot of ways that you can see. You can go and get a sketch at um, on the property appraiser, pull up your uh, pull up your property address and you can go to what's called sketches and you'll see the layout of your house. And that's something that is just a, a black outline of your property, uh, of your home. And then if you want, that's one thing, then you can actually design around that of what you have and what you want to change. And that's uh, helpful. You can also get aerial maps off of the, um, uh, property appraiser, uh, Google Maps is another thing. And so you can see a lot of different tools available to you. Um, you can draw it out. I would assume this is possibly using graph paper, but I don't see any reason. Uh, it, some of it looks like it's hand-drawn. Lay out and do as much prep and um, thinking and designing beforehand. Look at plants in other people's yards or if you see things that you like in people's yards, take a photograph. Um, look at uh, garden books, to see if you see plants, but you gotta make sure that what you see in a garden book or it's gonna work in the particular location you wanna put it in your yard because it may not be the right plant for the type of light it gets or, um, if you're adding it to a particular location, there may be space for a particular size plant or what you want it to do. Uh, we want to, again, lay out what have you got existing and then maybe a design of what you would like. And you want to group plants according to their needs. Uh, put plant, you want to draw in where you think you would like a tree for shade or areas where you want a vegetable garden or maybe a, a fountain. Uh, and with that said, once you've done all your homework and you have um, done your planning and then you start with selecting plants and Susan is going to go over that with you and we're gonna take a break now for about five minutes so that everybody can uh, like I said, get some coffee or tea or something to drink, and then we'll get started with Susan to do her part. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Let me do that trick there. 
Okay, let me do that. Okay, let's see here. Okay, let me I'm gonna share. Yep. Yep. That works. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, I think you'll need to stop sharing uh, because that's your presentation. Um, so you stop sharing first and then. Um, okay. So, well, we'll hang up for now. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye. Okay. All right. I think um, that's been about five minutes. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here on part two of design your landscape to your site conditions. Um, kind of drilling down a little bit more on Florida friendly principles of landscaping and particularly right plant, right place. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Again, number one, arguably the most important principle, right plant, right place. Number two, watering efficiently. Number three, fertilizing appropriately. Number four, mulch. Number five, attracting wildlife. Number six, managing pests responsibly. Number seven, recycling in the landscape. Number eight, reducing stormwater runoff. And number nine, protecting the waterfront. So we'll just briefly go through all of these principles in a little bit more detail. And again, if you're joining us uh, a little late, I'm Susan Griffith, and I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here at UF IFAS Manatee County Extension Service. Um, and right plant, right place, you'll, you'll recognize this if you've ever put the wrong plant in the wrong place, <laughs> it pretty much tells you immediately that it's very unhappy. <laughs> so if you plant in this full sun location, if you plant a plant that really needs a moist, shady 
a location with acidic soil, that sort of thing, that plant is going to be very unhappy. So you're going to end up having to water that plant like every day just to try to create the kind of atmosphere that plant really wants to be in. Um, so obviously that's not good. You're going to end up, it's going to turn yellow. Um, again, it's not happy. It's not in the right place. So you're going to end up using all this fertilizer on it. And of course, that's not a good thing either. So um, putting the right plant in the right place based on your site conditions and what that plant needs, really, really important. You're going to reduce your watering, you're going to reduce your fertilizer usage, your pesticide usage, as well as your labor and your stress too. <laughs> plant stress and human stress. Um, so why is Florida friendly landscaping important? Well, <laughs> um, environmentally, it's very important because 97% of the earth's water is salt water and only 2% of that of the earth's total water, or I'm sorry, only 1% of all the earth's total water is drinkable quality. And two thirds of all fresh water on earth is frozen in polar and glacial ice. So we haven't been capturing all this um, water that's been melting off of these glaciers. It's all been just joining into the salt water. So um, we did not plan ahead <laughs> for what is occurring now. Um, and we're getting into sort of desperate circumstances, um, particularly in Florida, uh, because of our projected population growth in Florida. It seems like everyone wants to move to Florida now. So um, Florida's projected population by 2060 is about 36 million people. And about 7 million acres of what is now rural and natural lands would then be converted into urban use. And just that area alone is an area equivalent to the size of the state of Vermont. So it's really a significant amount of land that is um, going to be converted into um, roads and you know impervious surfaces um, and housing. So um, we need to start planning ahead now on about how we're going to alter some of our behavior um, in order to um, keep up with this demand. And some other concerns as well that come along with the population growth are going to be obviously an increased demand for water, um, not just for our landscapes, but for our personal use. Um, so we need to watch now what we're doing in our landscapes as far as water goes, so that we have enough for our personal use in the future for our children and our grandchildren um, and beyond. Um, obviously, increased pollution is another thing that's going to happen. Um, decreased filtration of polluted runoff due to having all of these additional paved surfaces. And of course, also um, a dramatic decrease in wildlife habitat. We can't just keep squeezing all of these guys out of their natural spaces without serious repercussions. And domestic water usage is really high in the United States anyway, to begin with. Um, we are about twice uh, what the European usage rate is. And Florida is particularly high. We have one of the highest domestic water usage rates in the United States. And part of that is due to irrigation of lawns and landscaping and perhaps over irrigation of lawns and landscaping. So principle number two is watering efficiently. And we do have a couple of issues when it comes to watering. We tend to use too much of it, not knowing any better. Um, most people do tend to over irrigate their yards, especially um, in the pursuit of keeping their lawns, their turf grass looking perfect. Um, and then what we use is contaminated by pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, as well as other chemicals that ends up going back into the aquifer to be reused as drinking water. And 95% of our drinking water in Florida does come from these groundwater resources that are extremely vulnerable to pollution. Okay, so you can raise your hand. Um, which landscape here do you think uses more water? <laughs> or right in the chat, uh, is it going to be the one on the left or is it going to be the one on the right? <laughs> um, you can just type left or right into the chat now if you would. 
Um, I'm pretty sure we'll all be in consensus, consensus that we believe that the one on the left is going to um, use less water. Um, I'm pretty sure we will all be on the same page there. <laughs> okay, um, so reducing turf grass. Um, Turf does have its place in landscapes and it can be excellent for filtration and erosion control when it is healthy. Um, however, in many cases, turf grass really can be one of the neediest components of our landscape as far as really requiring water regularly. Um, there's no point where turf grass really gets established and then you can just cut off the irrigation like you can with other plants. So it's needy for water, it's needy for fertilizer, needy for pesticides and herbicides um, to keep it looking so-called perfect. Um, so becoming more Florida friendly can start with reducing the amount of turf grass that you use in your yard by limiting it just to functional purposes and replacing sections of it with plants that are drought tolerant and by expanding your plant beds of these drought tolerant plants outward. And using micro irrigation for your plants, making sure that you have separate zones um, for your landscape plants that are hooked up to micro irrigation can help save a lot of water. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that once they are established, you know, for a shrub, it depends on the shrub, but generally, you know, six to nine months, um, you can actually cut off that irrigation. Um, as long as you have the right plant in the right place, that plant should be fine without that supplemental irrigation. Um, just be sure to use Florida friendly and or native plants. Um, Florida friendly doesn't mean you have to use all native plants. As long as you're using Florida friendly species, that's also fine. Um, but uh, you really can cut off your irrigation to your plants once they are established. Um, remember that before you make any changes to your landscape, if you do live in an HOA, which most people do, um, you will need to get approval on any changes that you make before you make them. It is against the law. There is Florida friendly landscaping law um, that prevents them from penalizing you for um, adapting Florida friendly landscape principles in your yard. However, they do still have a say uh, in your contractual agreements with them and how you can do this. So you will still have to submit your plans to an architectural review board or similar, and they still have the right to deny you or make changes to your plan as they see fit. So we talked a little bit already about using some drought tolerant plants. These will uh, be plants that live happily without any um, additional irrigation other than the natural rainfall that we get. Um, this has been a very unusual month. May is our anomaly month <laughs> where we get pretty much zero rain and that's very typical. Um, but for the rest of the year, we do tend to get really regular rainfall all the time. Um, so again, really important to group your plants by their needs. You don't want to group a plant that has a really high water requirement um, uh, next to a plant that has a really low water requirement. Um, they're not gonna be happy. They're not gonna, um, you know, they're not going to coexist well in the same general area. Um, so all of these plants below will do very well in kind of high and dry spots with full sun. There's a native salvia coccinea that's beautiful. It's a wildflower. Um, it gets quite tall, um, reseeds itself merrily um, and enthusiastically. Um, rosemary, the culinary herb rosemary actually can be a landscape plant component. It smells wonderful. You can go out there and grab parts of it to use in your cooking whenever you'd like to, um, but really good plant for these high and dry spots without regular irrigation. Texas sage is another one. If you've ever tried Texas sage in your yard and it failed, it's probably because you had too much irrigation on it or not enough sun. So super high sun, super dry, that plant will be very happy. Um, and Leonotis lion's ear is another one that blooms for many months out of the year, pollinator friendly, um, really can tolerate those really dry, hot sun conditions. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. <laughs> okay, um, low maintenance plants, some examples of those. They'll need very little 
once they're once they're placed. Um, native cocoa plum becomes a large shrub or hedge. Native Simpson stopper is another great large shrub that can also be trained into a small tree, slow growing small tree. Um, Jatropha into Jerima is a non-native plant, but Florida friendly, large shrub, um, small tree, and King's mantle is a medium shrub. And both of those bloom for most of the year, very low care. Um, principle number three is fertilizing appropriately. So think about in nature, there's no one there um, in a forest, a natural forest to sweep up all the leaves off the ground, rake them up and, and get rid of them. So um, that's really what nature intended is to have these leaves falling there, decomposing and essentially feeding those plants with the compost that's created naturally. So um, I try to mimic nature in, in your property um, by leaving your leaves there. Um, it's recycling in the landscape. It's very Florida friendly. Um, and of course, using more native species in your landscape also reduces the need for the use of additional fertilizers. These plants have evolved here to, um, to live successfully in the soils that we have. Mulch is a very important part of Florida friendly landscapes. Um, two to three inches, not really more than that, is recommended to um, help hold in moisture so you won't have to water as much and to prevent weeds. Um, as Valerie mentioned, you just don't want to go too close to the center of the plant. You always want to leave that root ball exposed and keep it pulled away. Um, you don't want that mulch too high or close to the center of the plant. Um, we do recommend three kinds of mulch over all the others. Um, I'll repeat this again as we go. Flora mulch, pine bark, and pine straw are the three most sustainable types of mulch that are recommended by the University of Florida. Um, we do not recommend cypress mulch. It kills native beneficial cypress trees. So it is not considered to be a sustainable product. Um, mixed hardwood mulches often use um, mixed scrap woods that can contain chemicals that are environmentally damaging, so we do not recommend their use either. Uh, Flora mulch, the one that I mentioned, um, is made from the invasive melaleuca trees that have taken over, particularly in the Everglades. It's a huge environmental disaster um, planting those trees there many years ago. So they have essentially taken over the Everglades, and this is a win-win. This is a mitigation strategy for taking care of that horrible invasive plant problem in the Everglades. Um, it is also really one of the best mulches that you can buy. Um, so flora mulch, highly recommended. Um, unfortunately, it's so popular. The only place that has it now is Lowe's. Um, that should change. Big Earth used to carry it and Sweet Bay Native Plant Nursery used to carry it. Hopefully it will um, be back in, in their hands soon as well. But for now, Lowe's is it. Um, pine straw is another great option uh, for a forward friendly landscape as is pine bark. Um, which is the bark off of pine trees that are being harvested anyway um, for use in building homes and that sort of thing. So it's a, a byproduct of, of a tree that's already being cut down. Mulch is extremely important for so many different reasons. It conserves soil moisture, it adds nutrients to the soil as it breaks down. Um, so we do recommend using it over using rocks as mulch. Um, it protects against soil erosion, it reduces weed growth, it provides a habitat for the beneficial organisms in the soil that will help to improve that soil and keep it healthy for the plants. Um, it improves the, the appearance of the landscape and in areas where nothing else will grow, it provides an attractive ground cover. Here's an example of what your tree should look like. Um, and on the right hand side, you should be able to see um, the roots flaring out there. You want to have that trunk flare exposed. Um, you don't want to mulch beyond the, the drip line of the tree. Um, you don't want to ever, ever practice volcano mulching, we call it. Um, where you can see on the left <laughs> with the line through it, 
that is a very bad practice that is very, very detrimental to a tree. So here you can see on the left, the mulch volcano. And then if the mulch is removed, it obviously was there for a long time. And the trunk flare there has already been damaged. So you want to, excuse me, you want to avoid that at all costs by um, from the get go, not mulching too close to that trunk flare um, and covering up the, the flare of the natural flare of the roots. Attracting wildlife is principle number five. Uh, human population growth in Florida, of course, we talked about that a little bit already, uh, means it's much less space for wildlife. So um, we should all try to do our part now to start providing appropriate habitat for all of these native creatures that are so important and, and beneficial. One way we can do this is by increasing our vertical layering in the landscape. Um, to at least three different levels of having a larger tree, a mid-ground of having medium-sized shrubs, a foreground of small shrubs, and in some cases a ground cover um, of about six inches high to a foot high. Um, this makes wildlife uh, feel more comfortable and safe and really increases the amount of bird life that you will have in your yard, which I think everyone really wants. <laughs> Islands of vegetation are also very important for wildlife. Um, so you can break up big expanses of lawn area with these really easy to do um, native and Florida friendly plant islands. Um, it's just a matter of digging up a, a big swath of turf grass and, and planting it out, um, quite easy to do and very beneficial for many different reasons. Um, principle number six is reducing or eliminating pesticide usage. Always very important. There are plenty of beneficial predator insects out there who are working all the time um, to eliminate the, the bad guys, the bad plant pests. So um, before you just get out this spray bottle and start spraying away at any sort of plant pests that you see, make sure that you identify it first. Make sure, A, you're not killing like a, a butterfly or a caterpillar that's going to become a butterfly, for instance, and making sure that you're not wiping out one of these really excellent beneficial predator insects that's, that's working really hard for you. And if you absolutely must spot spray, if you've brought in a sample of a plant to the plant clinic and they've identified it as something really bad that you need to do something about, always use the least toxic method first. Um, use neem oil or horticultural soap or um, horticultural spray oil, um, one of these methods. And just keep in mind also, um, even though it says it's an organic product, um, you know, it will still wipe out good bugs, so you, you don't want that. Okay, recycling in the landscape um, is very important. You can just recycle your yard waste items. You can get yourself a compost bin um, and make some excellent um, environment, environmentally beneficial compost to use in your yard. Number eight, properly managing your stormwater runoff. Um, one thing to make sure is that your downspouts from your roof gutters flow into your landscape beds rather than onto impervious surfaces like your driveways um, or sidewalks. So make sure that they're going into where they make the most sense, going out to water your plants rather than watering your, your um, driveway. Um, consider getting a rain barrel to collect this water so that when you have a month like May, you can start using your rain barrel water that you've collected during the month of April. Um, they are pretty inexpensive, about $30. Um, you can buy them from us during the summertime months. Um, and the county, Manatee County generally has them throughout the year. Um, you can paint them to be pretty or paint them the same color as your home so that you can kind of hide them. And if you have areas in your yard that naturally are low and collect water, um, consider putting in a rain garden with plants that are uh, appropriate for, for such a condition. 
And the last principle, principle number nine, is protecting the waterfront. So planting appropriate native plants at the edge of water bodies, low growing grasses and other native plants that will help to filter out the chemicals from that lawn that's nearby um, before it all reaches the pond and results in smelly, nasty, toxic algal blooms in that body of water. So a 10 foot uh, low growing plant border is recommended at every water body's edge that's uh, not, uh, not a mowed area um, because mowing to the edge of ponds really does significantly increase the amount of nutrient going into that body of water um, with the nutrient laden um, grass particles that make their way in there. So having this 10 foot barrier is really advantageous. Okay, on back on topic, right plant, right place. Um, thorough planning really is the key here. And I may be repeating some things over and over. I guess that's okay because they always say people need to hear things a couple of times um, before they, they start to make it part of, of their thought process. So um, thorough planning, um, researching each plant ahead of time. And this means no plant impulse uh, purchases. So I know that's hard when you see this really pretty blooming plant in the store and, and you fall in love with it, um, but that may not be the correct plant for you. So um, really it's very important to, to research that plant ahead of time. Even I have made this mistake and I have some regrets. <laughs> Once you plant it, it's, you're kind of married to it in some cases. So really important to, to do your research on every single plant before you buy it. Um, now, are these good choices in planting? Absolutely not. You don't wanna have a wishbone shaped oak tree, certainly. Um, you don't want to have a punctured pool cage with a big white bird of paradise sticking up through it. And you certainly do not want to have a hundred year old oak that is completely glued to your foundation. All of these bad choices, wrong plant in the wrong place. So here are some examples of Florida friendly front yards. And this one in particular was someone who had a traditional front yard with, you know, really dominated by a turf grass lawn. And they decided to kill that off and start over again to have a more Florida friendly yard. And this is the result of that. Um, and these are not all completely native plants here. Some of them are non-native, but they're all Florida friendly. And obviously much more friendly to creatures like pollinators than having an expanse of turf grass. Um, so importantly, Florida friendly uh, landscapes do not have to be only native plants. This is a popular misconception um, as long as they are Florida friendly and that's also fine. Here's an example of a before of someone's backyard. And this is the Florida friendly remake of that same exact space, hard to believe, right? And here's another one, the before is on the left there. Um, and then you can see the, the beautiful remodel that they accomplished there. So here's an example of no grass at all in the front yard. This is all jasmine minima ground cover instead of turf grass. And here's no lawn at all, just wildflowers. I would venture to say this person probably does not live in an HOA. Um, <laughs> and here's a Florida friendly side yard or backyard example. And for the backyard, you can allow turf as we talked about for functional purposes, such as play areas and pets and that sort of thing. Um, but um, expanding plant beds is a much more Florida friendly way to go. So in planning your landscape, we're going to cover briefly the keys to success, a little bit into site analysis, determining your needs, preparing the site and design concepts and considerations. And 
And Valerie mentioned this book and this book you can get for free from watermatters.org, which I will have a screen on next that shows you those details. Um, but um, key uh, for this book is on page 31 and it goes over the different zones of Florida on the map here. It will go over the regions that it talks about in the book. Um, we're kind of on the cusp really of central and south Florida. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, it talks about the nativity of the plant. Yes, if it's a native, no, if it's not. Um, the growth height rate and um, spread of the plant, very important to know the mature um, gr growth of that or size of that plant, um, the pH tolerances, whether it likes a more acidic soil in the 4.5 to 5.5 range, or if it likes a more alkaline soil in the 6.0 to 8.0 range, or if it can really tolerate any soil, it will have these four dots there. Um, soil texture, whether it likes a more clay soil or a sandy soil or any texture. Soil moisture preference, um, if it likes it wet, it'll have a filled in raindrop. If it likes it well drained or drier, it'll have an open raindrop symbol. The drought tolerances, um, high, medium, low, or none. Um, light ranges, whether it really prefers to have full sun, that'll be darkened in, or if it um, prefers partial shade, that'll be highlighted. Um, salt tolerances, um, high salt tolerance, um, low to none or unknown, and what type of wildlife it attracts if it does attract wildlife. So this book is really, really helpful. And you can go to watermatters.org at this website and click on free publications and just add it to your cart. And that way they will actually mail it to you. The book itself is free and the shipping is free. Um, or if you'd like to, um, you can pick one up from our office. We tend to keep them up at the reception desk, but give us a call just to make sure that we have them in stock before you make a trip over here for that. All right, proper planning and plant selection. Um, really can't stress <laughs> uh, how important all these things are. It avoids those future problems. Uh, it'll save you money, effort, energy, um, water. It will make your landscape more enjoyable and ensures that your plant will be in the right place. Planning is a process. Um, plan first, plant once. Um, know the plants, know the conditions ahead of time. You can consult with us. Um, utilize uh, University of Florida's Florida Friendly Landscaping website. This is a really good site right here for that. Um, utilize regional gardening books and magazines. Keeping in mind regional is very important. You don't want to be looking at plants that are only happy in Wisconsin um, because they're a completely different menu of plants. So make sure you're looking at material that is for Florida. Um, also, we do have a landscape assistance program here. And if you'd like to do that, I'll have my contact information at the end and you're welcome to email me and um, myself and a couple of master gardeners can sit down with you and help you with plant recommendations for your yard. Um, I'll give you more information about that as we go on. Okay, so um, Valerie talked about this, choosing plants that are correct for your particular zone in the county. Um, considering the orientation of your home, if your home faces south, or west, of course, you're going to need those really sun tolerant plants in those areas. Um, you may have some microclimates in your landscape due to the fact that you're right by a very large pond, or maybe you have really large oak trees. Those um, large um, things like that can create a microclimate in your yard, which can sometimes protect you from um, really harsh freezing temperatures in those areas. Um, know your soil pH, the type of soil that you have and the drainage of your soil. And of course, use the Florida Friendly Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design um, to guide your plant choices. 
And here at the extension service, we, we can definitely test your soil for pH and soluble salts. We can also test well water for um, salt count content. Um, Valerie mentioned that briefly, um, that if you particularly live in an area that's near a large brackish body of water, such as the Manatee River, if you have well water, you may very well have salt water intrusion into your well. It's very common these days. So you might want to look at that. You might want to have your water tested. So very nominal fee. We will test for these things. If you test one sample of soil, for instance, for pH and soluble salts, it's five dollars to test for both. Um, so newer communities, those less than 30 years old and closer to the beach are going to have more alkaline soil. And that is mainly due to the materials in the home, the soil, the soil fill that was brought in, um, that sort of thing. And the leaching of all of those new materials that were used in the home, all of that is very alkaline, uh, all the stucco, the mortar, the concrete, the plasters, et cetera. Um, so most plants like to exist in soils um, that are less, either seven or less, and most of the soil that we test here in our lab is seven and to up to 7.9. So that goes to show you. <laughs> uh, most of the plants are not incredibly happy probably where they are. Um, so using native plants is another good way to combat that. Um, or, or Florida friendly plants that like a more alkaline soil. Um, and if you have certain desires for really particular plants that you really would like to have, like a gardenia or a hydrangea or a camellia or something like that, it's really far better to put plants like that into pots. That's what we recommend that people do. Um, it's really much easier. And I'm not talking about a pot of native soil. I'm talking about really good potting soil going into that, that pot. Um, and that way you can control the pH of that plant much more easily and give it what it really wants. So determining your needs, how you currently use the property, what do you need, what do you want? It's helpful to think of your landscape in terms of separate outdoor rooms. So you want to have your, your area of seating, you want to have your area for outdoor entertainment or cooking, you want to have the area where the kids or the grandkids can play and where the pets can run around. Um, you might want to have a vegetable garden, you might want to have these lounge spaces that are becoming even more popular now. Um, so think of it in terms like that and, and think of it as your, uh, kind of an extension of the inside of your house, but on the outside. And Valerie touched on this as well. You want to definitely consider the eventual size, mature height, spread, growth rate, shapes of this plant, um, the salt tolerances, the shade requirements, the pH requirements, the susceptibility of pests, whether it's non-native or native. All of these considerations are very important. Um, you don't have to be an artist to sketch out um, you know, a plan for your yard. Even the most rudimentary, simplistic drawings are very, very effective. So um, sketch it out, include the light patterns. That's really important. You might wanna do a couple of these. Um, you'll want to maybe be there in the house for a while if it's a new home for you um, to really get a great idea of, of where these light patterns are. Um, where there is the most sun, the most shade at different times of the year as well, because that really changes, right, from winter to summer um, with the, the way that the sun changes. So um, point out also where power lines are or other restraints um, to keep in mind for the mature size of uh, a tall tree or a tall palm. Um, and of course, light is one of the most important basic needs for your plant. Keep in mind um, what the, the plant needs and where you'll be putting it. And another important thing is determine which existing plants you want to retain. So you want to identify all the plants that you have 
Um, and you may want to retain a lot of them. And that's definitely recommended. They're already established. So it takes far fewer resources to, um, to keep that plant happy if it's already there, if it's a desirable species, if it's not invasive um, and you like it, by all means, go ahead and keep a plant like that. Um, go with what works for your zone. If you're 9B or if you're 10A, if you're way out east in Mayaka, really far out there, you might be 9A. Um, draw vague plant shapes. You don't have to be an artist, again, just vague plant shapes um, so that you know where you want to place these things. Have a key uh, for which is which. Um, and again, don't make impulse plant purchases, no matter how tempting they may be. Um, prepare your site, remove unwanted plants and debris, fix the grade, amend your soil if need be. Um, and of course, this is a, a great zone map to remind you of, of where you are in the county. Most of Manatee is 9B, some of it's A. Um, and what that means is zone 9B, the lowest lows are going to be 30 to 35. In 10A, your lowest lows are going to be 35 to 40. Um, of course, these are just averages. And of course, there are occasional weather events where zone 10A has seen temperatures drop into the 20s. And when that does happen, a lot of plants do receive damage, but it, it's very few and far between. And it rarely happens anymore these days with, with climate change, unfortunately. If you end up pushing your zone and you, if you live in 9B and you end up getting a 10, a 10 B plant that really should be in Miami, <laughs> just know that you're going to have to protect that plant if it gets really cold. Um, some plants are sensitive below 40 degrees. So keep that in mind. Another reason to really do research and know your plant or you will be spending a lot of your winter covering up plants. If you live near the Manti River or the Bay, remember that um, you can definitely have some salt spray, even in a, a mild wind event, you'll have a lot of salt spray. So uh, make sure if you live in an area like this, you're going to want to make sure that you choose salt tolerant plants. Follow the rules of good landscape design, design with odd numbers. So ones and threes and fives are good. It visually looks better to have um, those odd numbers rather than even numbers. Um, and I always try to avoid having two of the same matching plant opposing one another uh, because one will invariably go downhill while the other one is thriving. They'll never be matchy matchy anyway. So it's really better to have asymmetry from the beginning than try to fight with two perfectly matching topiaries, let's say. So here's an example of that asymmetry with cohesion. So you can have a cohesive design that's not matchy-matchy. You can repeat um, the types, the colors, and the textures and make it asymmetrical while still being really visually appealing. So this is an example of a really pretty shade garden. Um, I think this is at Fairchild Tropical Gardens in um, South Florida. You can use trees to your advantage to help you with cooling and heating. Um, if you utilize deciduous trees, trees that drop their leaves during the winter, um, that's advantageous because then that allows more sun in on those sides of your house at the times of the year that you need the most heating, whereas they will regain their leaves in the warmer months of the year. And by summertime, they'll be completely full of leaves and, and they'll impart that lovely shade and cooling effect that you need during the summertime. So um, you can really do a lot to save on your energy you're heating and cooling both by planting deciduous trees um, appropriately. So um, planting deciduous trees on the south, east, and west sides will go a long way for, um, for helping you out with your, with your cooling and heating. 
And it is important to consider wins here um, because unfortunately, I hate to even say these words, but we are entering into hurricane season very soon. June 1st, our hurricane season starts. And we always hope that we have a mild one or none at all, but um, it is something to consider here where we are. So um, oaks and bald cypress have really good wind resistant. Um, American elm and sycamore both have rather poor wind, wind, wind resistance. So that's another important thing um, when you're thinking about adding trees to consider in Florida. Um, generally the rule of thumb is if it's a really fast growing tree, it's probably not going to have very good wind resistance. Um, and if it's a really slow growing tree, um, it's probably going to have really good wind resistance. So this again, I'm repeating something that Valerie talked about, but this is something that happens almost all the time that people plant their trees too deeply. And it really does have deleterious effect on the health and longevity of the tree. And there's no point in doing it wrong if you can do it the right way and, and add you know much benefit to the life of this tree. So um, you really do not wanna plant your trees or your shrubs too deeply. Uh, make sure that you're sticking up um, an, at least an inch, if not a couple of, of inches. Um, for a really large tree, you can go as high as like two to three inches above the, the hole, um, the top of the hole. Um, much, much better for that tree. Avoid fertilizing a tree until it is completely established. A lot of people don't realize that either and they heap fertilizer on it immediately. That's not a good idea. Um, aim for a great diversity of species in your yard. Um, it's called a monoculture when you have large expanses of the same plants and monocultures are more prone to disease pathogens and insect infestations. And they just aren't as sustainable as a really diverse plant community. Um, so you don't want to aim for having a huge long hedge of the same plant planted closely together. Um, if one of them contracts a disease, it'll spread throughout the entire hedge. Um, and then you may have to replace the entire hedge. So if you start off with several several different species to grow as large individuals that are hand pruned rather than planted really close together and hedged together, the monoculture issues are avoided. And I always like to tell people, um, it, you know, when you're hand pruning, um, think of it as a doctor going from patient to patient, right? You, you sanitize your tools in between those patients. <laughs> um, so you avoid spreading problems. Um, this is something that if you have a, a service, uh, they're not going to have the time to do this. But if it's something that you can do on your own, definitely do that whenever you can. Sanitize in between species and in between individual plants as you prune. So formal, really manicured landscapes do not work really well in Florida. Um, it's fine for up north, I suppose, but it's, it really doesn't work well here. So monoculture hedgerows are something for the United Kingdom. They have the appropriate climate for it. Here we have too much heat, humidity. Um, we have rampant insects and disease. Um, having something like this is really a losing battle and you'll constantly be fighting it with too many pesticides and chemicals and fertilizer to keep it green. So it's really not a Florida friendly thing to do. Um, here are some examples of, of landscapes that are Florida friendly. As you can see, it's definitely not a manicured look. It can be tidy, um, but it's, it's not formal and it's not manicured. And you can see there's a lot of diversity of species. And you can still have a lot of color um, these are all native plants here, and there's a lot of color and a lot of interest, a lot of different textures. So with shrub selection, keep it simple. Um, select, you know, based on your research, again, for mature size and water needs, group them according to the water needs. Um, 
if they all need dry, you know, if you have a whole group of things that needs dry, group those plants together, obviously. Um, if you need things that need a little bit more moisture or shade, put those in the right place too. Um, and of course, space them out according to the mature size so that they're not overcrowded together. Um, this is another thing I'm mentioning again, Valerie talked about this, but again, to reiterate, um, you don't want to put it too close to your home or other structures. So um, if that plant's going to be five feet wide at maturity, you want to have it half the, the mature distance plus one foot away from your home. So a five foot plant needs to be three and a half feet away from your home. And mulch, leave that root ball open. And don't try to force things to grow where they don't want to grow. Um, turf grass just won't grow in some shady areas of your yard. So don't keep fighting mother nature. Don't keep replacing it with turf grass. Um, instead, uh, expand your beds outward and put in shade tolerant ground covers um, for a more permanent and Florida friendly solution. And now we're gonna talk about some of the plants. Um, creeping salvia is a really great native ground cover for really shady areas. It, it spreads really, really well. It's very sturdy. And it's also a butterfly host plant. Um, it does much better. It looks much better if it's in the shade. Blue days as well. Blue days is not native, but it's Florida friendly. And it gets those really pretty blue flowers. Um, leopard plant, um, Farfugium japonicum, great name. Um, unusual foliage. It has really pretty tall yellow flowers in the wintertime when hardly anything else is blooming. Um, so it's quite nice. Um, there's also a cultivar with speckled foliage. It's really cute. Um, it can take cold temperatures as well, and it does need um, really shady conditions to thrive. And these are all for shady areas. Um, Philodendron xanadu is another great uh, ground cover type of plant that gets um, really slowly grows from about two feet high to a mature height of about four feet high with a mature spread of four to six feet. Um, again, looks much better if it's planted in the shade. A foxtail fern is another one that um, really can tolerate dry conditions. It does look better if it's in a shady area. It has really interesting texture. Um, it's, it's kind of artsy looking to me and it's a fun plant. Um, and mature size is three feet by three feet. Excellent drought tolerance. Um, here's some more shade area ground covers. Peperomia is a native drought tolerant plant. Um, it's not salt tolerant. It's not picky about pH at all. It will rot if it's overwatered and it will die in full sun. So these are definitely for shade. Mondo grass will grow in deep, deep shade. Um, any type of soil, um, medium salt tolerance on that one. Cast iron plant. It's not salt tolerant, um, but it's really, really tolerant. It's called the cast iron plant for a reason. Um, it is a bit taller than most ground covers. It gets up to about two and a half feet high, but um, it will fill in a pretty good sized area and is really kind of a bulletproof kind of a plant. Um, our native Kunti, the Zamia floridana, very, very tolerant of most conditions, sun, shade, um, high salt tolerance as well. Uh, really easy care plant there. Um, same with African iris. It tolerates most soil types and pHs. It does have this really pretty bloom a few times a year. It'll, it'll put out these blooms. Um, it has moderate drought tolerance and it can also survive extended flood periods, um, but it's not salt tolerant, however. Here are a couple of vines that I wanted to tell you about that a lot of people are afraid of vines and you've had a bad experience probably at one point with a vine, I have too. Um, but these two are really pretty well-behaved vines, I have to say. Of course, being a vine, they do need a structure. So you need to have them growing up an arbor or a trellis or something like that, or even on a fence if you're allowed to do that. Um, but these two are really well-behaved. Um, Native coral honeysuckle can live in really any zone at all. Um, the key, native Key West morning glory 
it is rated for zone 10 to 11. It's native to the Keys. However, if you have a microclimate situation, um, we have this plant growing all over in 9B. And as long as it's in an area where it can be protected, if it's growing kind of shaded by a tree or something like that, um, it, it has survived the past like five winters with no issues. So um, just know you may have to protect that depending on your, on your situation. Um, the Japanese paper plant, very interesting uh, architectural plant with very interesting foliage as well as flowers, um, Fatsia japonica. This is a medium to large shrub. It eventually can get up to 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, too much sun can kill this plant. So it's a true shade lover. King's mantle is an old garden classic in Florida. Um, it's a non-native, but it's been used for a hundred years here in Florida and has proven itself not to be invasive. Beautiful shrub. It blooms for most of the year with these really pretty flowers that are purple with a yellow throat. It gets to be about six feet by six feet maximum, and it stops there. So it's really nice. You barely have to prune it at all. If, as long as you're okay with having a six foot by six foot shrub, you're good to go very tolerant, very easy. It just doesn't take too much sun though, the king's mantle. Um, here are some that can take a part shade location. So some sun, some shade is okay. Um, you don't wanna do the full blasting Western sun for these guys, but a part shade is good, part shade, part sun. Yellow sustrum. Um, this is a pretty good sized shrub, kind of sprawling shrub, lots of yellow blooms on the sky. Um, pretty tolerant of soil, um, only medium salt tolerance, but is drought tolerant once established. Um, again, the Turk's cap, not a salt tolerant shrub, but um, this is sometimes called the, the hibiscus that doesn't open. <laughs> it looks very much like a, like a closed hibiscus flower all the time, um, but it does have constant red flowers that are, are really very pretty. Um, and it's very tolerant plant. The copper leaf, um, these guys are the, the part shade, um, part sun, part shade, or I'm sorry, shade, part shade. So full shade, part shade, um, not full sun for these guys. Uh, copper leaf, um, this one, some varieties of it are okay in zone nine. Other ones are a little more picky about zone um, that need to be a little warmer, um, but a lot of them are okay for zone nine. Dracaena Song of India is a really striking, um, it can be a, a specimen plant for your yard. It can be kept as a hedge as well. Um, really easy to prune it and the cuttings root really easily as well. So you can make new plants out of this plant very, very easily. Um, the Brazilian red cloak is, um, it's actually salt tolerant, which is unusual for a flowering shrub like this. Um, it gets to be about 15 feet tall and about 10 feet wide. So it's a very large, robust shrub. Um, this is why it's important to know <laughs> how big they're going to get, because that's not ideal for some landscapes. Um, it's kind of a, a big monstrous thing. So some people put this in and then they end up taking it out because it's too big. But if you go in knowing that it's going to be that big and you plan for it, it can be lovely. Um, and it gets these fantastic blooms, these big reddish plumes that last for months and months. It's really quite nice. Um, but needs that, that shade, part shade for sure to look its best. Um, and shell ginger is another one for deep shade areas. It looks much better. You've probably seen it looking kind of peaked. If it's placed in full sun, it really doesn't look that great. Um, but in full shade, it's really quite beautiful. And it does bloom with really pretty cascades of lovely scented, um, gingery scented uh, flowers. Uh, it's quite lovely. Here are some um, native shady plants, shade lovers. The beautyberry has these fantastically beautiful fruit um, that comes in the fall just after it flowers in the summertime. Um, beautyberry, most pH is okay, uh, except for really highly alkaline soil. It doesn't really like that. Um, 
the wild coffee plant, another one, it looks pretty bad if it's put in full sun, but in the shade, it's beautiful. It has really glossy, highly textured leaves that are quite attractive and um, is a great pollinator plant. And around this time of year, it, it's in full bloom and it's just surrounded by a multitude of bees right now. And then after that, it goes to berry with these really attractive red berries that are also very striking. So really nice plant. Um, and it doesn't get really large. It's a medium shrub. It gets to be about six feet high and about three feet wide. And we do have actually native azaleas in Florida. A lot of people don't realize that. There's the Florida flame, which is more of a yellowish orange as pictured here. And there's also a, one called pinkster that is a really pale pink that has a similar looking flower, really pretty. Um, now, of course, like all azaleas, they do need a more specific acidic soil. Um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, they have a little bit less of a, of a moisture tolerance as far as that goes and low to no salt tolerance. So um, like most azaleas, they do pretty well planted under an oak tree. That's a really good place to, to plant the native azaleas as well. And here are some palms that actually need shade. They will not look good if you plant them in a sunny area. So the, the bamboo palm, the non-native but Florida-friendly Shemitaria Florida hybrid is a clumping palm. So that's where it gets its name, bamboo palm. It, it resembles bamboo, it's really attractive. So if you're afraid to have bamboo because bamboo gets so large, this is a nice, neat little, palm that stays very contained for you. Um, and the lady palm, Reefus excelsa, is another one that's a clumping palm. Um, it doesn't look quite as much like bamboo as the other one does, but it does have a very um, Asian look to it, um, especially as it matures. Um, it does get up to about 12 feet tall, and it's moderately salt tolerant and um, like some a mid-range pH. And the windmill palm is one of the most cold tolerant palms in the world. Not that we really need that here, but it can actually tolerate 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty amazing. Um, the, this plant is sometimes grown in, in Europe, like Northern Europe, um, and it survives the winters in many cases. Um, it gets only about 20 feet high and it can take a great deal of shade. And it does have a really interesting hairy trunk. Here are some large colorful shrubs for part sun, part shade areas. Um, any zone is fine. Our native firebush, Hamelia patens, likes um, part sun to full sun. It'll bloom a lot more if it's placed in a uh, sunnier environment. It does bloom most of the year. Um, it does have low salt tolerance, but it's very tolerant of type of soil. Um, the chase tree, um, Vitex agnus castus, it's a non-native, but this particular species is considered Florida friendly. Um, part sun, part shade, and it does bloom, really pretty blooms in the summer. It can self-seed, um, medium salt tolerance, any kind of soil and mid-range pH is good. Um, all of these are really great pollinator plants as well. Um, especially this red fire spike is a really good example of a non-native plant that is really good for butterflies and hummingbirds. It has those red tubular flowers to provide the nectar. So it blooms in the fall and the winter at a time of the year when a lot of things aren't blooming, right? Because a lot of things bloom in the summertime here. So this one's really good that it blooms um, pretty early in the fall and lasts all the way through winter. And then there's a fuchsia one that blooms right after this red one does. So if you can get the red and the fuchsia cultivar, you've got months and months of, of bloom and it's very tolerant. It just does need that um, part shade location really to, to look its best. It doesn't wanna be in full beating sun. Um, here are salt tolerant plants. These are the ones if you, if you happen to have a, a really, you know, salty soil condition for whatever reason, or you're, you have salt water intrusion in your well, 
these are excellent choices for you. Um, silver buttonwood is a native that can be up to a 50 foot tall tree, but also can be kept as a large shrub. Needs full sun, extremely salt tolerant. You see buttonwood growing amongst mangroves. They're that salt tolerant. Um, necklace pot is another highly salt tolerant. Um, any pH is fine. It has really interesting foliage. Um, all of these are native and it has those yellow tubular flowers that are really good for hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, some shade is okay for that one as well. Silver saw palmetto, really beautiful um, variety of the palmetto. Um, really striking, especially when it's um, used in front of darker plants. Um, it's salt tolerant, pH tolerant, prefers part sun, part shade. Um, that one's moderately salt tolerant. Um, a Simpson stopper is another one that is all around tolerant. Um, it, it does prefer a mid-range pH, however, um, in any zone at all. Another really great pollinator plant with the Simpson stopper and birds love the berries that it produces as well. So all of these are really great wildlife plants as most native plants are. And cocoa plum is another native. Um, this one has edible fruit. It's edible for humans as well as animal, other animals. Um, this one is tolerant. It prefers a mid-range pH. The uh, natal plum or carissa. This one is a non-native, but it's tolerant of all conditions. It likes a sandier soil and it also has edible fruit. Um, it does have thorns, however, um, but nice large shrub. All of these are large shrubs. Um, and the native coral bean, Erythrina herbacea, again has those great red tubular flowers for the hummingbirds as well as the butterflies. Um, it is deciduous, so it will lose all of its foliage in the winter, and then you'll get the really pretty striking red blooms, and then the foliage will start to come back in the summer. Um, Mexican sage is a beautiful medium height sun lover. Um, when it's blooming, it's just spectacular and butterflies will love it. Um, the salt tolerance is unknown, unfortunately, on that one. Uh, Devil's Backbone is a great sun-loving three to four foot tall shrub. Um, it's extremely drought tolerant. It has very interesting foliage um, and is great for any soil pH. Um, just do not water it. It can also live in part shade as well, just as well as, as sun. Here's a couple of Sun loving, not so salt tolerant, um, medium sized shrubs are native lantana. Um, just be sure to avoid non native lantana. So, if you're going to buy lantana, get it from a native plant nursery. Um, this pineland lantana is a nice little shrub that gets to be about four feet high and about six feet wide. It can live in really poor sandy soils. It hardly needs any irrigation. It can take some salt spray. Um, it doesn't like inundation of salt water in the roots, however. Um, but really low maintenance. It blooms most every month out of the year continuously. And butterflies love this plant. They love this plant. Um, Thryalis has really pretty flowers. It's not really so much of a, of a pollinator attractor though. Um, pollinators really don't go after the flowers, but they're really pretty and they can be used in like flower arrangements. So if you do that, this is a nice plant to have on hand. Um, it's a large shrub, typically um, max size is nine foot by six feet. Um, and it's, it takes, you know, really any kind of soil condition at all and a typical um, soil pH range. It's non-native, but Florida friendly. And here's some ornamental grasses that are native. Um, muley grass uh, looks like a typical grass for most of the year, but then in the fall, it is just stunning with that display of, of purple plumes. Um, 
very tolerant plant, salt tolerant, tolerant of any conditions. The same with Fakahatchee grass. There's also a dwarf Fakahatchee grass. The large one gets up to about six feet by six feet. So it's pretty massive, but the dwarf is better for most landscapes. It's only four feet by four feet max size. And Elliot's love grass, very tolerant as well. It can take a little bit more shade than most of the grasses. So this is a great choice for a little bit shadier area. And it's also a much smaller statured grass getting only about three feet high um, at the most. Usually you'll see it more like a foot and a half to two feet really at the most because it kind of cascades down a little bit as it gets taller. Um, really great little plant. Here are some ground covers for sun. Um, these guys are really, really low maintenance, full sun, low water needs, sandy soils are fine and they form clumps. The jasmine minima, this can be used in large areas. So if you're having an issue with um, growing, you know, nothing will grow somewhere, this might be really helpful, an area like on a slope, um, an area under a tree where no turf grass will grow. Um, it can grow in the sun or the shade. It's very dense and thick once it's established. It can't be mowed, but it can be um, weed whacked and edged to um, control it. Um, it can't really hold up to constant walking on it, but you could lay thick um, stepping stones through it. And it's not native, but it is Florida friendly. Native porterweed is another great um, ground cover. This can be used in part shade or part sun. Again, it can't be walked on, um, but it, it stays pretty low to the ground. Um, not to be confused with the non-native porterweed that becomes a really tall shrub. Um, this one is a low ground cover. This is another great native ground cover, um, twin flower. And there are two species. One is for dry areas and one is for more wet areas. So make sure you buy the one that's appropriate for your site. Um, once it's established, it can be mowed on occasion. Um, it cannot be walked on regularly, and it is a butterfly larval host plant. Perennial peanut is another um, good choice for tough areas. Um, it can freeze back in winters, though. It will return in the spring. Um, you may not, for that reason, you may not want to go all out on this for a large area. Um, because, of course, when it's disappeared, you can get weeds growing back in its place. Um, you don't want to overwater it. It doesn't need much water at all. It does not spread by seed. It spreads by rhizomes. It's not native, but it's not considered an invasive, but it can be a little aggressive. Um, sometimes it can be interplanted with, with turf um, if that's allowed by a community um, because it is mowable. And another good choice for interplanting with turf, as you can see here, it was used as an interplant with turf. Um, if you live in a community where that is allowed, it can be mowed, even though unfortunately when you mow it, it does knock off the really pretty pink flowers. Um, it's an excellent um, bee attractor. Uh, so um, it, it can be walked on, it can be mowed, um, so it really does make um, an excellent ground cover for full sun areas. If you live in an area that's a little colder, it may die back in the winter. Juniper is another great um, ground cover, very tough, high salt tolerance. Um, in the horizontal, the creeping juniper has medium salt tolerance, very drought resistant once it's established, and it is evergreen. Bromeliads are another great ground cover, and there are some that really thrive in the sun and some that absolutely have to have shade. So again, research um, for you by um, really an endless variety of color and texture, so they can really make a beautiful ground cover. And they got, keep spreading on their own. <laughs> Um, here are some large trees for full sun. The winged elm is a, a nice deciduous choice, right? We talked about des using deciduous trees to our advantage as far as heating and cooling go. Um, and so this would be a good choice for that. A native, it can get quite large, up to 70 feet by 40 feet wide. Um, high drought tolerance, but it can also tolerate ponding um, and has really interesting winged branches. 
of course, the live oak we're all familiar with, not to be used for small yards, of course, because it gets up to 80 feet tall and 120 feet wide at maturity. So you need a, a pretty large space to accommodate a live oak. But if you have that space, by all means, it's a wonderful plant to use. The Southern Magnolia is another very large grand dame of the landscape. Um, this one gets very large, um, up to 80 feet tall eventually and 40 feet wide, but there is a smaller cultivar called the Little Gem, and that one is, gets to be about half the size. So a lot of, of people will go with the Little Gem Magnolia instead for a smaller yard. Still just as good. Here are some medium Florida-friendly trees, the Weeping Yalpon Holly. Ilex vomitoria pendula is very interesting because it has that weeping habit. Um, you do want to plant it further away than they have it from this house in the picture um, because it is um, considered flammable like all hollies. So um, general rule of thumb is about 30 feet away from your home if it's going to be a, a flammable plant. Um, the sweet acacia is nice if you want a really airy look that you can kind of see through a tree. Um, some people need that in certain circumstances. So the sweet acacia has really lovely smelling yellow flowers for most of the year. Um, it does have thorns though, so be careful where you plant it um, because of that. The laurel leaf snail seed is these trees with a fabulous name. Um, Hardly anyone has ever heard of this tree. It's non-native, but it's very Florida friendly. It, it's a smaller tree, gets up to 20 feet tall by 20 feet wide. It prefers full sun, but it can also take some shade and it does have medium salt tolerance and parts of it may be poisonous, but parts of a lot of plants may be poisonous. <laughs> Okay, small to medium trees for full sun. We're probably all familiar with the crepe myrtle, another deciduous tree. So that would be another good candidate for what we were talking about earlier as far as planting it strategically um, to assist with heating and cooling. The same with the um, trumpet tree, also deciduous. Um, most of the really heavily flowering trees are going to be deciduous. Um, um, bottle brush is actually not though. Bottle brush is evergreen, and there are only two species that are deemed non-invasive. So make sure that you go with one of the species that is not invasive. Um, they have profuse red blooms and are very appealing to hummingbirds. And they generally get to be about 15 feet high with about a 15 foot spread as well. And here are smaller trees for full sun, the dwarf point sienna. Um, don't confuse that with the, the huge royal point sienna that you may be familiar with. This little one um, gets only about 12 to 15 feet high and about 12 feet max wide. Um, blooms for several months out of the year. Not quite the same bloom, of course, as the royal point sienna, but more of an orange bloom, but still very attractive to um, hummingbirds and butterflies. Powder puff, same thing, very attractive to pollinators. Gets to be a max height of about 15 feet high by 15 feet wide. Um, very tolerant. It can grow in the sun or the shade, really, this guy. Um, it can be trained as a tree or you can keep it as a large shrub. Um, and it's just a, a lovely addition to any landscape. Just be sure to, to get this particular species that I have listed here, the Caliandra hematocephala. That one is definitely not invasive, um, whereas some of the other ones might have a tendency to be invasive. And Jotropha, I didn't mention Jotropha earlier. This becomes a nice little small tree of about 15 feet high by 15 feet wide. It too blooms for most of the year and very attractive to butterflies and hummingbirds as well. Okay, I think that's the last of the plants as far as the good plants go. Um, again, learn to recognize the bad plants. Very important to identify if you have invasive species in your yard. If, if you don't know what you have, you can always send us pictures. Um, manateemg at gmail.com 
is a good source. You can also send them to me. My email will be at the end of this and we'll help you get your plants identified. Um, no matter where you live in Florida, at some time, at some point, you'll probably have one of these unwelcome plants take root in your yard. And unfortunately, the lawn maintenance employees are not really trained to, to recognize them. And so they'll just, they'll overlook them. They'll let them get really big and then you're gonna have to spend you know, potentially $900 to have this invasive tree removed from your yard um, if you don't catch it in time. So you want to make sure you catch them when they're still seedlings, when you can still get them out yourself, when they're easy to remove and you don't have to spend any money. So air potato vine is a really egregious one. If you have this, you really need to start working on mitigation efforts to get rid of it, nip it in the bud, get it out of there. It'll smother everything in your landscape and kill off all the other plants in your, in your landscape. And it um, is controlled by removing all the bulbs that you see there, that potato looking bulbul. Um, and there's also a, a beneficial insect that you can order from the Department of Agriculture. Um, a little beetle that that helps to control this plant. Invasive carrotwood is another really bad invasive species. Um, this is on par with Brazilian pepper as being one of the most invasive trees that we have to contend with. So learn to recognize that leaf if you see that start to come up. It likes to come up in other shrubs, like up through the middle of, a, of another hedge. It'll poke up its little leaves. Um, letting you know that it's there. Um, but as soon as you see it, get it out of there. It's really, really bad. The same with this one. Learn to recognize that leaf. This is the Brazilian pepper. Um, it's really a huge problem in Florida that we need to all be on the lookout for to remove it as soon as we see it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Mexican petunia, a lot of people really like this plant, but it is also invasive. It's not on par with the Brazilian pepper or the carrotwood, but it, it is considered invasive and we do not recommend that you plant this plant. Um, a couple other bad ones are the invasive Schefflera. They also call it the umbrella tree. Also highly invasive as is the invasive lantana. And unfortunately they still sell this invasive lantana at the big box stores and places like that. So that's why I always tell people to only buy lantana from the native plant nurseries. That way you know you're getting the native and you're not buying something that's invasive. So look out for that one. And here are just a few parting thoughts before we, before we part today. Always check with your HOA um, if you have one before making any landscape changes. Remember to aim for as much diversity as you possibly can with your landscape, not just a monoculture of all the same things. Um, research and know the needs of the plants and plan your landscape well in advance. Don't make those impulse plant purchases. Try to keep your um, high maintenance turf grass only to limited areas to be functional, such as play areas for kids and pets. Use shade loving ground covers in areas where, that are too shady for grass to grow. Consider the wind tolerance of your trees. Group your plants together according to their needs as well as their visual impact. Choose low maintenance plants whenever you possibly can. Reduce or eliminate the need for chemical fertilizer and pesticide usage. Choose plants that will welcome beneficial wildlife and give them a safe haven in your yard. And please remove those invasive plants. And before you dig, dial 811. This is a free service we have. Um, utilities companies will come out for free and mark your underground lines if you have any so that you don't get fined for cutting into anything um, or you know, risk bodily injury by cutting into something that could hurt you. Um, always look up and think big when you're planning for your mature height and spread of trees. You don't want to plant those anywhere near existing power lines or trees or structures. And make sure you don't plant foundation plantings too close to the foundation. Remember, it's half the distance of the mature spread plus a foot or even two to be safe. So if your max spread of that shrub is 12 feet, you want to plant that shrub at least seven feet from your home. 
And I mentioned this before, if you need assistance, we can help you. We do have a free landscape assistance program here um, as part of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Um, we just need you to provide us with um, your uh, pictures of your property and your existing plants, a sketch of your property, like Valerie mentioned, you can also get it off of the property, um, property appraisal site uh, for Manatee County. Um, all of these things can be emailed. Um, your structural features, I actually have um, a questionnaire that I'll send you if you reach out to me about this. So that covers all of these other things so that we can get an idea of your landscape and how we can best assist you with it. We don't do design because that takes away from the landscape design professionals that are doing it for a living. And this is a free service, but we can make, um, you know, well thought out, well researched um, plant species recommendations for you based on your site conditions. So soil testing is also highly recommended. Um, if you can do that um, prior to um, starting with the landscape assistance program, that is a really important part of it. So we know what kind of soil you have, what your pH is and what your soluble salts level is. Okay. Um, environmentally friendly landscaping is very important. Your yard is an integral part of the protection and the preservation of Florida's environment. It is very important for us all to start viewing our landscapes as part of the ecosystem rather than something that's separate from it. Once you are Florida friendly, you can be recognized for it. We can come out and make a big fuss and give you a beautiful sign for your yard. Um, so keep in mind the decisions that we make about our landscapes have a profound impact on our water quality. With a little bit of thought, our landscapes can combine beauty, function, and environmental protection so that many future generations can enjoy the Florida that we know today. I thank you all very much for joining today. Um, if you have any additional questions or if you'd like to participate in the Landscape Assistance Program, here is my email. Please feel free to reach out um, with any questions at all or to get more information about the Landscape Assistance Program. And I thank Valerie as well for her part in it. Um, you did a great job, Valerie. It's always nice to work with you. You too, Susan. And, oh, thank you. Thank you. So um, are there any questions right now or... Are we good? Now, if anybody needs, again, what Susan had put in before, if you want to have a link to this uh, presentation, put in, if you haven't already put in your email uh, into the uh, chat section, then we will, you can do that now and just mention that you'd like that for when we have it available. Yep. Okay, it looks like we got a few. Um, yeah, we have a few people in the chat. Valerie, have you been taking down these um, emails? Yeah. Yes, I've, I've got it okay. in the chat and I'm, I'm copying that. So I've got it, we're keeping track of it. Wonderful, okay, great. Well, thank you all very much for joining today. And we will just stay here just a little bit longer in case anybody thinks of any other questions or uh, whatever, if they want to put their information in for something uh, in the chat. We'll give you about another minute or two and then we'll be signing off. Yep.
answering a question right now um, about the site where it'll be recorded in the future. Once it goes on, it will be on the Manti County Extension YouTube site. Um, and if you just type in Manti County Extension YouTube, you'll come to it. And then you can see all of our past recordings of all of our classes as well. If you, if you select a video, um, you can watch everything that we've ever done basically. Um, uh, let's see. But if you, um, if you do put in your email address right now, we will be able to send you a link um, that we'll receive sooner than that. Um, I think we'll probably do some editing um, it will take a little while, and then once it's edited, it will eventually go on to the Mint County YouTube site. So eventually you can find it there. We have a, a ton of different recordings on there. Um, so it's kind of fun on a rainy day to just watch a bunch of people geek out about <laughs> landscape topics and <laughs> we have some really great um informative sea life um videos from our sea grant agent too there's some red tide stuff on there too um so lots of good information yeah definitely yeah uh, here's another person that put on their email um Okay, just one more. Okay, I think we're going, we're probably done for today. Yep. All right. And we thank everybody for coming and we look forward to seeing you uh, real soon again at some of our programs. Yep. <laughs> everybody have a great day. Okay, I'm going to sign out here. I'm going to stop screen share. I'm going to stop.